It's a great privilege to be included in this panel, and my thanks especially to Tom and to Michal for inviting me. I am in many senses an outsider here, but less so than it might first appear. To begin with, I'm not Irish, but my Lithuanian and Latvian Jewish grandparents in fact met and married in Dublin in 1914, and my father, uncles and aunts were all born and spent their childhood there. More proximately, unlike most of tonight's panellists, I'm not a member of the University of Limerick. However, over the last decade or more, this university has been as important a context for my thinking as has my own. In particular, before the Rallerheim Centre for Utopian Studies was formally inaugurated, Tom Moylan launched a seminar series in 2002, both here and in Galway, in which he invited scholars from across the world to reflect on how they had used the idea of utopia in their own work. Think, perhaps, he said, about utopia as a method. Now those papers, including my own, were later published in the Rallerheim book series as Utopia Method Vision. And when the Rallerheim Centre was set up the following year, Tom asked me to act as external consultant. When he spoke of Utopia as method, he had in mind Frederick Jameson's Brecht on Method. But he also echoed an article I had just written on the need for a more utopian approach to social policy, based not on short-term fixes, but a revisioning of society as a whole. And he quite unwittingly echoed a statement by H.G. Wells in 1906 about the proper vocation of sociology. In the context of that Fabian pursuit of a better world that President Higgins referred to in his lecture at the LSE just, just a year ago, Wells had declared that the creation of utopias and their exhaustive criticism is the proper and distinctive method of sociology. Over the last 10 years then, I've been working on this idea and Utopia as Method, the Imaginary Reconstitution of Society will be published later this year. Now, if that seems like an unashamed plug for the book, it is and it isn't. Because what I want to stress is how important the connection with this institution has been in fostering that work. Besides attending many workshops and conferences hosted by the Rallerheim Centre, which has become a key focus for utopian scholars across the world, I've been honoured to be part of a workshop on music and utopia, co-hosted by the Irish World Academy, <coughs> to participate in work at the School of Architecture, to join in a meeting about the regeneration of the city of Limerick itself, to visit Clough Jordan Eco Village, and to share a platform with your now president under the auspices of ISCS, your Institute for the Study of Knowledge and Society, then directed by Pada Kirby. <coughs> so if we are interrogating the critical capacity of universities, <laughs> to provide a space for the inclusion of utopian or transformative thinking. The University of Limerick has a very strong track record here, both within individual disciplines and at their intersections and at the interaction of academic inquiry and practical life. You are supremely fortunate that the task here is not to create a space for the kind of transformational thinking President Higgins rightly endorses, but simply to preserve, protect and expand it. And of course the preservation of such spaces in such difficult economic conditions is no easy matter. But you do here have a head start. But if utopia is a necessary country, we do need to reflect a little on what we mean by utopia and what it might mean to describe utopia, as Wells did, as a method. Culturally prevalent lay understandings of utopia are, are twofold. On the one hand, utopia is commonly dismissed as an irrelevant fantasy. On the other, utopia is traduced as a blueprint producing violence and terror, a malevolent nightmare leading to totalitarianism. Both of these foster a politics of quiescent subordination to the dictates of capitalist markets. 
A more informed academic view might equate utopia with a literary genre. A series of speculative fictions from Thomas More's 1516 Utopia, from which the term itself comes, through the key fantasy tests, texts, such as Edward Bellamy's Looking Backward, William Morris's News from Nowhere, Charlotte Perkin Gilman's Herland, through to contemporary authors such as Kim Stanley Robinson. The concept of utopia with which we are working here is much broader and follows from the work of the German philosopher Ernst Bloch. For Bloch, the utopian impulse is a recurrent desire for the world to be otherwise, which sometimes indeed takes the form of compensatory fantasies and wishful thinking, but also implies willful, purposive action to transform the world. Action which, in the context of economic and ecological crises, has never been more necessary. This approach implies that expressions of social dreaming, of the desire for a transformed existence, are diffused throughout culture and take different forms in different historical circumstances. I think we need to understand utopia then both as this diffused and sometimes fragmentary critique of the present and prefiguration of the future, and as a more holistic vision of a potential alternative social world embedded in its ecological context. For when we come to talk of utopia as method, I think in fact we have two connected methods. When we look at music or art or religion or poetry or literature, and I mean here all literature, not a specific utopian genre, there are often traces of protest against the real and claims for its transformation. Making these traces explicit and visible involves using utopia as a hermeneutic method, a method of excavating and understanding a particular aspect of given cultural forms. What is implied here of the good life, the good society, of what it means to be human, of what things are good for humans and make them happy. In the case of music, often held to be the most utopian because the most abstract of the arts, we have the conundrum that this utopian character is sometimes held to reside in the words of songs, in the music itself, in the social relations between performers, or in what the saxophonist John Harl calls the point of grace between audience and performers. Art is inseparable from utopia because, as, as that great utopian William Morris put it, Art, using that word in its widest and due signification, is not a mere adjunct that free and happy men can do without, but the necessary expression and indispensable instrument of human happiness. Now, if Morris seems a very English utopian to invoke, it's worth notice, noting that the Hammersmith branch of the Democratic Federation, which he established in 1883, had as a founder member E.T. Craig, who 50 years earlier had been the steward at the Owenite Rallahine community in County Clare, after which the Rallahine uh, Centre for Utopian Studies is named. And that Yates's formative years were spent in the same area, including participating in Morris's Hammersmith Socialist Group. I actually went to the same school as Yates. Morris would have been the first to insist that art alone is not enough and that the material conditions of life are fundamental. Indeed, he also said that surely anyone who professes to think that the question of art and cultivation must go before that of the knife and fork, and there are some who do propose that, does not understand what art means, or how its roots must have a soil of a thriving and unanxious life. And he went on to add, underlining the role of utopian imagining in the education of desire, but it must be remembered that civilization has reduced the workman to such a skinny and pitiful existence that he scarcely knows how to frame a desire for any life much better than that which he now endures perforce. It is the province of art to set the true ideal of a full and reasonable life before him, a life to which the perception and creation of beauty, the enjoyment of real pleasure, that is, shall be felt to be as necessary to man as his daily bread. So the point of utopia in its artistic expressions is to encourage people to want more, to imagine what it might be to live more fully. But it demands that we turn to the question of creating Morris's thriving and unanxious life and what kind of society would make that possible.
And if we turn to utopia in this more holistic sense, the me method it gives rise to is different and is best understood as an imaginary reconstitution of society. And this has three aspects. An archaeology which interrogates the ideas of the good society embedded in political visions and policy proposals, such as the neoliberal fantasy that is driving a lot of contemporary politics. As ontology, this method also addresses what sorts of people are imagined to inhabit those societies. And as architecture, it asks both how we could arrange matters differently and what the implications would be for the kinds of people we are or might become. For our institutional arrangements affect both the imagination and the reality of human flourishing through the values, skills, capabilities, experiences and relationships they encourage or suppress. There are advantages to thinking of utopia as a method rather than a plan. It is holistic. It is expressed at the level of concrete social institutions and processes. It allows an element of ethical and institutional separation from, from the present. And importantly, its explicitly hypothetical character enables us to insist on utopia's provisionality, reflexivity, and dialogic character. For explicit alternative scenarios for the future are fundamental to any kind of democratic debate. Utopia as method is concerned with the potential institutions of a just, equitable and sustainable society. And of course, with the complex processes by which we might hope to get there. <laughs>